Everybody can hear me? Yes? Great. So, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It is my pleasure to be here. I will try to give you an overview about different projects that we have been uh, taken in our lab. And uh, as already mentioned here before, uh, there are different circumstances that bring us here today. And uh, as mentioned already, uh, the BRAIN initiative was one of the biggest push towards this goal where basically it was recognized that we need to come up with a new arsenal of tools that allow us to better understand some of the uh, neuroscience and neurobiology uh, that people are struggling to actually understand. And the other aspect is that, well, even the National Academy of Engineering realized that, well, if we are really as good as we believe we are in terms of the way that our brain works, can we actually learn something from our brain? And how can we reverse engineering such that we can then integrate this knowledge into technology to make technology better? Well, of course, that these initiatives that they spread all around the world. For instance, in Europe, you also have the equivalent program that tries also to understand uh, different aspects, both in technology, both in understanding cognition, and so far and so on. This is not new for this audience. Uh, but uh, there are different aspects that probably were not yet emphasized enough, and I would like to wish us what exactly brought us to today, and why is today a good time to do what we are doing? Well, one of the main reasons is technology. So today we have technology that we didn't have before, and technology is evolving in a really good and nice space. And here are only presented two different technologies. Most of you already saw some of this technology in the different talks that we have seen. And the question is, uh, what kind of uh, information these technology provides us with? Well, some of this information, for instance, in the case of MRI, well, we can do either tracking the oxygen consumption in different regions of the brain, uh, which is here uh, captured by some correlation in terms of the corresponding time series, or we can just try to recover the white matter tracks by diffusion imaging. OK, so <coughs> we have technology. Now, how can we use this data, and how can we explore, and what can we do with it? Well, I believe that the opportunities to do work with these data are huge, but I believe that we can actually equip uh, the community with a set of unique tools that we all have uh, used in the past that are borrowed from control systems, dynamical systems, network science, and they can be leveraged in order to better understand some of the problems the uh, neurocognition, uh, neuroscientists and uh, uh, physicians have in their own fields. And I'll try to kind of pass along the idea how can we use some of these tools. And in today's talk, what I'm going to try to do is, uh, of course, that everybody has their brain wired in a specific way. Uh, everybody is better to do some specific tasks or not. So the question is, how can we explore the relationship between the structure and the function of the brain? And well, you may at this point ask yourselves, why do we need to care about this? And uh, why is this somehow relevant? Well, the first uh, point is, well, this is also a way to understand uh, healthy versus uh, unhealthy states in the brain. For instance, we are familiar with Alzheimer's disease. Here you have a slice that is healthy versus the one that is affected by severe Alzheimer's disease. And we know that this entails also a loss of functionality uh, uh, for people that actually suffer from this disease. And better understanding then how the function arises from the structure may allow us to understand how can we develop new therapeutics in order to mitigate some of the side effects. Now, I'm speaking about structure and function, but the first thing that we have to do when we tackle some of these problems is to try to quantify these and try to understand and put ourselves in a common place where terminology actually is common across different uh, people. And this is important because some of these terms, they sound okay in the sense that, well, structure, function, we have an idea about what structure and function is, but what exactly do we mean when we want to quantify and analyze these problems? And let me give you an uh, overview about how people uh, in neuroscience usually they see these kind of problems. So the first thing you start doing, and this is kind of overlapping a bit with the introduction that Evelyn made before, well, you start doing a decomposition of the brain in different regions. Towards this decomposition, you use either accumulated evidence or some imaging techniques in order to figure out which neurons look more alike or function-wise, which ones activate at the same time, and then you parcelate the brain in different regions. Now, once you have this parcelation, what you do is, well, we can think about each of the regions as a node in a graph, and then you are going to create edges between these nodes uh, depending on a specific uh, structural property of the brain, which in this case will be a function of the white matter tracks 
that crisscross two different regions. In other words, that these two different regions that are associated with the nodes. And of course, you can associate with the network a specific adjacency matrix. And this matrix, in general, for the structural connectivity, and by the way, this is what we are going to refer from now on as structural connectivity, usually sparse. So the sparsity varies between 2 to 20%, depending on the, uh, how many regions you are dealing with. Now, on the other side, you take the same regions, or at least some equivalent sites, and what you can do is to keep track of the uh, blood oxygenation uh, being uh, occurring in different regions, and you keep track of these time series, and of course that blood oxygenation serves as a proxy of neural activity, so you can usually associate with these uh, time series uh, some neural activity, and what you then do is, well, take the correlation, so the regions are still the same, so they correspond to nodes in the graph, but now the edges will correspond to the correlation between the time series in different sites. Of course, that's the same way we had an association with the adjacency matrix. You can do it for the functional connectivity, yet, contrary to what happens with the structural connectivity, these matrices are usually dense. So, given these two different concepts, the concept of structural connectivity and functional connectivity, the question can now be formulated as, can we take this structural connectivity and for an individual be able to recover its functional connectivity, the empirical functional connectivity of an individual? And this was somehow the problem that we tried to tackle. Now, because technology is not at the stage that we can actually use the data in order to understand uh, all possible tasks, we'll start with the task that uh, somehow it's uh, the default test that you start with, which corresponds to the resting state. So the resting state will be the case where your brain is not doing any specific task at uh, any particular moment. As you may imagine, this is not completely straightforward to achieve, but is a starting point. And the first thing you have to do once you start working in this area is to understand, okay, people have tackled this problem for quite some time, what did people propose to do? And this is one of the state-of-the-art papers that was out there when we start tackling this problem. And uh, this is, again, this is to understand how can we recover the resting state functional connectivity of an individual given its structural connectivity. And of course that the first question is, okay, how can, can we quantify how close these things are? So what is the objective? And here is uh, one thing that is kind of straightforward, and I realize that it's kind of straightforward for us engineers, yet sometimes it's not always obvious what the objective should be. So in this case, the objective is going to be the following. So we just take some norm, we take the empirical functional connectivity, and then we want to find a predictor that takes the structure and gives you a functional connectivity of an individual. Now, what these authors propose is to leverage some concepts that already existed out there in the network science community and try to combine them such that they can justify, so this is kind of related with the interpretability of the results and data, as Nathan was referring yesterday, and try to use this in order to understand what are the somehow motifs that will kind of rule the functional connectivity of the brain. And what the authors proposed was then, in this case, in this paper, to consider four different motifs. One is the weighted path length, the path length where you just count the number of steps between two different nodes through the shortest path. You have the search information that accounts not only for the shortest path between two nodes, but also to the possible out degree of each of the nodes in that shortest path. And finally, you have this notion of path sensitivity that basically counts to the number of possible detours one hop away from the shortest path. So you can see that, okay, here we have one hop away, one hop away, then you come back to the shortest path and so far and so on. So the question is, once you start looking at these metrics, in the back of your head, you should start wondering, as I did and my co-authors did in the past, why not considering more general structures? Because see, once you look to this path sensitivity, what you're actually saying is you're counting the number of triangles where one of the edges is actually in the shortest path. So if you now have a triangle, why not start thinking about squares, pentagons, hexagons, and so forth and so on. And this will entail much more information about the network. So keep this in the back of your mind and we'll go back to that in a second. But then once you have these key motifs, the idea is, okay, can we combine and how do we combine? So basically, the predictor that was provided or proposed in this paper was uh, the following. So basically, we do a combination of these different motifs. And once we find through least squares the optimal weights that we should assign to these motifs, it turns out that we are able to justify around 
of the data. Meaning what? Meaning that if we take the functional connectivity of the individual, the empirical one, and then you try to see how it correlates with the one that you just computed, it turns out that it's around 40% at most. Now, in private communication with the authors, uh, it turns out that it was not, or it is not expected at this stage that we will be able to do more than 50%. And the reason being that somehow the nature of this problem is intrinsically static. So we are not accounting for the intrinsic dynamics of each of these regions. And this should be clear that it makes sense. So we still try to this, and we decided to take this problem and even from the static point of view, how much can we actually understand functional connectivity from structure? So what we did was, well, we build upon the ideas that I just mentioned and the idea, well, we take the same objective, but now what we're going to do is to account for higher order uh, geometric uh, entities. And well, this can be easily captured by just considering the structure matrix, so a GSC matrix, and to the powers of it. So basically, we're counting the number of walks up to a power k for the matrix X, uh, S power k. And it will be a combination of these. Then the second aspect is that C, whereas the structure of uh, the structural connectivity is sparse, the functional connectivity is dense, so this might not be enough. So we may need actually some similarity information, and therefore we propose to basically do a, an arrangement of the frame uh, using a rotation uh, matrix. Now, once you pick this predictor, well, we can just replace in the objective. We get something slightly different, and most important, the nature of the, or the complexity of the optimization problem that we are now uh, need to address well, it's slightly different. Yet, there's one advantage about this kind of problem, which is it arises in different fields. So basically, it's common to appear in optimization per se, natural language processing, image and signal processing, and therefore we can basically use it in our advantage. Yes? Uh, sorry, but just for context, if I were to measure F uh, and then measure it again a month later or three months later, do you know what the L L2 difference would be in those cases? Uh, I don't. Uh, so basically here we have a resting state, so we take data from an individual and we basically try to then consider different uh, snapshots of the data in order to do the resting state functional connectivity. But I cannot tell you a week from the moment we are doing this test how much it will vary. Uh, yeah, but I just mean that if F to F across days only has 50% explainability, then you're 40% off of the right? Because you're not really solid. Yeah, sure, sure. But, but yeah, we have not had enough data to consider across weeks. <coughs> but uh, the thing is, structure-wise, the structure of the brain does not change that often. Uh, it changes slowly over time. So if we assume that most of the data is being justified by the structure, we would expect the function to not change as well as much during the resting state. But there are also some aspects that are difficult to justify in terms of the so-called resting state, because it's not that easy to ensure that someone is doing literally nothing. Okay? And actually, that is going to show up in some of the results once we do the competition. Okay, so we have now came across a problem that is usually non-convex, but what we're going to do now is to do some uh, suboptimal approach. And for that, uh, we are going to rely on some spectral graph theory, which kind of uh, is used to give the name of spectral mapping problem. So we want to map uh, these problems using spectral graph theory. And spectral graph theory, basically what you are going to do is to consider that you have these just the matrices associated with the networks, and now the idea is, well, we can do eigen bell eigen vector composition, so you have the eigen modes of these different matrices, and you want to match these eigen modes. And using this notion, well, it would be easy to see that, well, if we actually write these as the eigen composition, well, we can basically say that, well, this quantity will be equal to zero if we basically have ensured that these two quantities are the same, so if the spectrum is the same, and second, if the eigenvectors associated are also the same. That would be the ideal scenario. So what we do is basically a suboptimal approach, which is we first try to match the spectrum, and then we will try to match the eigenvectors. Now, how good this approach is will depend on the specific kind of data you deal with. But in our case, we will show you, uh, we think we perform quite well. And uh, here is just some illustration about how the spectrum of the structure and the functional look like, as well as some of the eigenvectors. And in collaboration with people from the University of California at Santa Barbara, we collected data from 84 individuals. We then actually considered the individuals with very different features 
uh, the most important one is age and of course also the fact that some of them were actually left-handed. And here what you have is the results for this data set. So in the x axis what you have is the maximum path length, so basically the k of the powers of the matrix that you are considering from 1 to 7. And then here on the vertical axis what you have is the correlation between the empirical and the obtained functional connectivity for the individuals. Now, one thing that we can easily see is that there are two colors, one red, the other blue. The red is basically the training, whereas the blue is the testing. And we call it in sample out sample. Now, if you consider just paths of length one, what you already get is that, well, for the testing side, you get around 50%. Whereas if you start increasing the maximum path length and you end up like in five or six, you can see that if we are considered the training test, we get almost perfect uh, um, fitting, whereas for the case of the testing, we get results that are in the order of 80%. Now, why is this somehow surprising? Because as I mentioned before, the state of the art was about 40%, and it was not expected to be more than 50% in the general setup. Now, I would like to come off, go back here and see that somehow this predictor is not just about intuition, about changing the frame, but also has the interpretability of the walks. And at the same time, this notion of the rotation comes out of the formulation itself, where we kind of know what we need to fit in the optimization problem. So moving forward, the question that we then ask is, OK, now we have a way to kind of identify what is the function from the structure for each of the individuals. But then the question that follows up is, well, we are still all human beings, so there must be some properties that are common across all of us. So the question is, can we use similar methodology to understand what would be common to the different structures, uh, connectivities of the individuals, and try to find what is common in the function? And for that goal, what we have to do well is to just consider a subset of individuals and try to set up a problem that will try to find what is common across different individuals. So basically, we want to find the rotation and the set of parameters that will be common across a specific subset of individuals. Now, the results will be slightly different, as you would expect, because, well, we are hopefully different from each other. And uh, you can see here on the left hand side and the right hand side the difference between the results. On the left hand side you have the individual setup, on the right hand side you have the group. And you can see that for similar uh, parametric choices, for instance if you think about k equal to 5, you get that uh, around 50-55% is common across different individuals. Which is interesting. Now, this is interesting to know that there's 50% that is common across of all of us, the follow-up question is, so what exactly is common across all of us? And we then actually took the eigenvectors associated with the corresponding uh, justification, and we realized that these eigenvectors actually provide you some interesting information that is not completely new, but it's kind of interesting to understand. So the first eigenmode, so basically the first eigenvector associated with the largest eigen value basically tells you that uh, the brain is in its default mode for most of what is common across different individuals. So basically, you can see it as the energy available is distributed more or less uniformly across the brain for whatever you need to do. Uh, second and third, they kind of match some visual aspects as well as motors. And then the final one, which is kind of interesting, kind of uh, overlaps with the regions that are associated with decision making. And why is this interesting? Remember that the setup of the experiment was we want to figure out what is the relationship in the so-called resting state. Yet, try to imagine yourself inside a huge machine doing boom, boom, boom all the time with people saying, don't think about anything, okay? It's like me telling you, don't think that actually your nose has something on top of it and you will start scratching it in a second, okay? So it's very difficult to do literally nothing and that kind of also shows up in some of the results. Now, this is overview about this kind of first approach on how to use these methods to understand uh, some neuroscience problems. In particular, one of the key things is, again, interpretability of the results. So one could think about, okay, why not just take some classifier and try to match these things? Uh, and the reason is, well, we need to better understand what do these uh, results tell us and to the neuroscience community at large. And of course, there are still some work to be done, either in both task-associated uh, setups or in the case that we consider some dynamics. Now, 
this is just some of the work we are doing currently in our group, yet there are way more space for imagination and use of the tools that we have in our own community. And uh, for instance, one of other aspects that I would like, and I think I can afford to do that being the last speaker, is to emphasize some of the key points that were uh, emphasized throughout the, the workshop. One is that we still have to go back to biology, okay? And we also did some of that. So for instance, once we start looking into the uh, EEG devices, the wearable devices that people have out there, we have noticed that they have been deployed mainly to use in the context of machine learning applications, but forgetting about the underlying uh, biology. And actually, if you start going into the biology, so somehow related with the notion that we should now start kind of uh, connecting the different layers of uh, scale that we encounter and try to understand what is the underlying reason for what we are observing. For instance, this is a slice of the, the cortex. One of the, the else, uh, kind of neurons that show up in this area is the so-called pyramidal neurons. People have showed that the ensemble of neurons respond in a so-called fractal order dynamics. So you start to now outreaching to models that are not as common within even our own community. And then you start noticing that even most of the analysis in the EEG, they are mainly temporal or just spatial, but not temporal and spatial at the same time. So you are doing either or or, whereas we have actually the tools to understand how these spatial temporal processes actually uh, do the interplay between themselves. And this is interesting because then you can actually ask, okay, so how many sensors do I need? So what is the information I should be looking at? And basically you can see that if we have a budget for the number of sensors, the displacement of these sensors is actually quite diverse from the one that you have uh, in the context of some of the wearables available today. And by the way, following the suggestion of uh, Professor Roger Brockett, here's a kit. So this is something that is nice to do and always look good uh, in the slides. So now, other projects. So one of the most interesting projects that I have been currently involved with is uh, try to quantify things that have not yet been quantified before. And uh, I, when I started doing this project, this was pretty much what happened. Someone showed me this and told me, okay, so what do you see? And I was, well, I see stuff going on, but nothing in particular because I'm not a physician, either I had the correct training. So, of course, that you can talk for a while and you see, you are able to kind of capture some features like there seems to be like a lot of uh, correlation across this area over here. There's some kind of high amplitude going on in all these channels. Uh, there's somehow kind of fast frequency before this happens and so far and so on. But uh, the question is, can we use tools from control systems theory to actually quantify this phenomena? And what phenomena exactly? So first of all, this is related with the seizure onset of a patient. Actually, you have two different kinds of seizures over here. You have a partial and a complex generalized one afterwards. And this is the important aspect because see, as was already mentioned here, we have this amazing technology, deep brain stimulation. Most likely in the five years from now, we'll be speaking about optogenetics and how to control this technology. But we still miss the, one of the key ingredients uh, of uh, control systems, which is an objective. See, and I'm speaking about an objective, not the model. Sure, I agree. Models, it's always a difficult business to talk about. But if we don't have an objective, a way to quantify these objects, we are not going to be able to benchmark how good are we doing with respect to different kind of technology available in the market. So we basically took this challenge. We have some preliminary results. The paper should be on archive in two days or so. Uh, it has been submitted, but it's on this pending thing. So we tried to do a push for you guys, but unfortunately, it was not yet on time. Uh, basically, what you can see is you can use some of these very simple let's say analysis that you are taught when you do like nonlinear control, basically you linearize the system and you see how the system evolves and you see very interesting phenomena occurring both in the frequency side that we just need to look to the complex plane and we see what information the poles are telling you. And it's kind of interesting that during the seizure, the poles, what they are doing is well, they increase the frequency. At the same time, they also increase the, synch the synthetic the stability, and then after the seizure, they come back to a specific region. And it's kind of interesting that this is kind of telling you somehow what we would expect to see across different channels, but in a condensed way. The other thing is, well, suppose for the moment, and this is not the entire story, suppose that for the moment, you can actually 
somehow track these eigenvalues and you can somehow control the occurrence of a seizure by mitigating, or, or in this case constraining, the evolution of these eigenvalues. So it turns out that you can now think about a specific goal that you can then implement in a narrow uh, simulator device or deep brain simulation at large. And you basically can try to kind of change the pattern, whereas previously you had a kind of a V, you can say that you can somehow change the pattern. And this, hopefully, if this is the key uh, indicator that you are actually having a seizure, you may be able to mitigate the side effects of the seizure. And uh, with this, the conclusion is that, well, I have shown here a couple of problems. I think that regardless of all the problems that we can work on, education is going to be a huge part of it. We need to start rethinking education in the sense that it's not possible to know everything. At the same time, we need to understand the language in order to communicate with each other. And that kind of brings me to this small picture on the left-hand side, which is this is a highly interdisciplinary research. So we need to actually put some effort, and I know that time is a very scarce resource, but we need to put the effort and time to understand what our collaborator is actually talking about in order to come up with interesting problems that can only be solved in the context of interdisciplinary research. And we did this context, well, in a very small way, I want to thank all my collaborators in this field, in particular Cassiano was, that is sat somewhere in the room, over there, uh, was responsible for doing some of the nice pictures and the simulations and hard work that I presented here today. And with this, I would like to thank you very much and if you have some questions, I would be glad to address them. Thank you. So, uh, because I'm chairing the session, I'm going to uh, take the prerogative of, that, of asking the questions. Related to something that Nathan and brought up yesterday about scale. And so I, I, I do a lot of work in imaging. And you, you showed a lot of the, the great work in the brain of the Connect Home Project at Washington University was very involved in. But my understanding is that the, uh, we're reaching a limit on the strength of the magnetic field that we can put people into without it being at best uncomfortable, but perhaps painful and, and what worse. Uh, so it's a resolution issue. You know, that, that, that we're, we're, we're reaching a resolution point here, and so we're not, we, can, we may not be able to use these particular methods to see uh, smaller scale. And, and so to what extent are your results, do they rely on the scale of the measurements, the, the resolution of those measurements? Because some of the last ones had much larger uh, resolution cells than some of the earlier ones we showed. Sure. So regarding the main part of the presentation today, we have actually done some assessment about how the scale affects the quality of the results. Now, one of the good things about uh, using the tools from control systems is they come sometimes with some guarantees. And for instance, if you actually bound the error that should come from the alignment of the spectrum and eigenvectors, you can have an idea about how far off you will be with respect to the optimal solution. Now, in terms of technology, it is true that we are bounded by the current technology. At the same time, I believe that there is a synergy going on between technology and theory. So if you start using methodology from control system theory, I mean, we have for a long time work on questions like system identification, etc. So we can now safely induce some kind of virtual point in, the, in between two different measures and with some biophysics or dynamics in the line of the brain might be able to complement some points that we will not get directly from the measurements. And then we will be able to assess the possibly the quality of these same points. And this would be something that is own complementary to the technology of course, but it will somehow make it better. And I think that sometimes you have the following. Technology evolves. It reaches a point where it's no longer evolving. Then people from theory realize that, well, it would be really nice if I have also these on top of this technology. And you come back and you think technology and you basically have this kind of closed loop that then pushes everything forward, both knowledge in the theoretical side as well as technology. Side. And on the imaging side, we're working on uh, higher, other uh, imaging modalities that develop some quite uh, uh, You mentioned at the end of your talk that time is a very scarce resource, and I think we have run out uh, of time. Uh, so. Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Shinang to make, uh, or Jurishan to make uh, closing remarks. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, so I think that brings us to, to the end of our program. Uh, so Jurishan and I, I think, have been delighted at the, uh, the talks and the discussion that's occurred over the past couple of days. Uh, and I hope you all have enjoyed it and got something out of it. And, uh, 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 we hope to put together some sort of a, a summary uh, uh, 
that uh, we'll be uh, distributing uh, in the coming uh, time frame uh, in the future. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the meetings. Uh, maybe on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you guys for having us here.